Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you. This, this microphone is on, I can see. Um, and extra credit for everybody who's coming here at night. Uh, so just let us have your records and we'll put on your permanent record uh, that you were here this night. Um, it, it is really great to see so many folks. And uh, what you're attending is a plenary session co-sponsored by the OEH Public History Committee and the Committee on National Parks Collaboration. And um, they imagined together what would be most useful uh, for, the, for the OAH and uh, really helped inspire this and put it together. So we're really grateful to Spencer and Christine Arado. So our goal this evening is to analyze the problem of memorialization, especially memorialization of the Confederacy, and to discuss what we as historians might do to help our communities and our nation find a way forward. We're fortunate to have three people well qualified to talk about this issue, and I'd like for them to introduce themselves and tell us how they've been working on this topic. Turkaya, would you like to begin? It, it sounds like it's working, yes. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Turkaya Lowe. I am Chief Historian for the National Park Service. I'm also Deputy Federal Preservation Officer. Um, as many of you, I hope all of you know, uh, the National Park Service is the federal agency that is primarily charged with um, preservation and stewardship of our nation's historic resources. Uh, we have 417 national parks uh, that are under the care of the National Park Service. We also administer the National Register of Historic Places, which is the list of sites, buildings, structures, historic districts, and objects which uh, illustrate American history. Um, within the National Register, we have listed the National Historic Landmarks, which are, again, those sites and historic resources which are nationally significant and have a high degree of integrity. So not only do we manage and steward the national park sites, we also provide technical assistance with preservation and interpretation of local historic sites through the National Register and National Historic Landmarks Program. My name is Christy Coleman, and I am CEO of the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia. Um, where I have served for 10 years now. And five years ago, we actually created this institution by, yes, I can use the word now, merging um, the American Civil War Center with the Museum of the Confederacy. We created a new 501c3 um, to do that. Uh, and it came on the, uh, in the midst of the sesquicentennial uh, in 2013. Um, by 2015, the combined prominence of the two organizations really pushed us into the conversation, not just in Richmond, but we were starting to get calls first about the meaning of the Confederate flag, what people refer to as the Confederate flag, uh, often the Tennessee battle flag versus uh, ANV, um, and then uh, the murders in Charleston really set things off. And so in a very short period of time, um, again, we were thrust into the conversation nationally, not just in Richmond. But Richmond would not be wait. Um, so uh, this past summer, um, I was asked to serve as co-chair for Richmond's uh, Monument Avenue Commission to look at how could and should um, the city of Richmond respond. And we were initially given two very, what I considered very simple mandates. First of all, to consider what contextualization might look like, what it could mean. Um, and then number two, to consider what other historic figures could um, be placed there. Um, unfortunately, after the events of Charlottesville, the mandate expanded and the mayor said, you have to, as did a number of voices within the community, said we have to also look at what removal would mean in Richmond. I'll leave it there for now. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jack Chen. I am a co-founder of the Museum of Chinese in America. And many of you probably know that in many ways Chinatown, which has both had a disappeared history, but also a history that people seem to, well, uh, for tourists, a sense that people feel very familiar with Chinatown. But in fact, the Chinatown they're familiar with is not the Chinatown that actually is historically accurate or resonant. Um, so coming out of that, I've really been looking at New York City history. And um, I, I teach at New York University. Um, just this past summer, uh, the mayor's commission, the uh, mayor Bill de Blasio set up a commission to look at public art monuments and markers. Uh, he gave 90 days um, to do that, uh, and we had three meetings and five public hearings. It was an impossible task that was set up. It was also, uh, to his credit, he wanted to do something. Um, at the same time, he immediately started talking about removing certain markers and um, Columbus Circle, and that immediately kind of caused a, a media furor. Um, in the process of those meetings, it became clear that whether Columbus, the monument state or not, whether Teddy Roosevelt's monument in front of the American Museum of Natural History state or not, there's a deeper issue that the city really was not addressing. And a number of us began pointing that out. We were talking about how unless we had a larger context of how the city talked about itself in terms of dispossession and also enslavement, that actually these free-floating um, discussions really didn't have anything to anchor. Um, so out of that, um, the co-chair, Darren Walker, uh, asked a few of us to start a new organization. So I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, I just also want to say that I'll be starting a new position at Rutgers at Newark, and I've been asked to actually um, look at the Gutsan uh, Borglin uh, Wars of America monument, which is right in the downtown square of downtown New York. And um, many of you know that he was the uh, sculptor of um, Mount Rushmore. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a longer history that many of you, I can see a number of you nodding, so you're familiar with some of the issues. He was associated with the KKK, and uh, now the people who are developing the park want to, um, in a very positive way, uh, think about how in their refurbishing of that monument, how to, how to grapple uh, with that, that history. Um, just the final point is that I believe that a lot of the future is really with the, um, the surveillance devices that we carry with us all the time, uh, but certainly wearable technology. And that uh, I think it's something that the public and students can get deeply involved in if we can think about how to present this work in a provocative and effective way to get more people drawn into these questions to really understand um, what the stakes are. Thanks very much. As you can see, we're uh, well staffed up here with people with expertise. Uh, I'm Ed Ayers. Uh, I'm a historian of the 19th century America. I'm Christie's uh, collaborator at the museum and on the commission as well. So I have some skin in the game uh, as well. But my job tonight is to be moderator. And we structured this conversation as a town hall meeting, a conversation with the audience rather than a self-contained panel followed by Q&A. So be ready for that. And we hope to hear from as many people as possible with finely crafted questions and comments. And I thought. Uh, as you can hear already, the Confederate memorialization issue is going to open up into a lot of other issues. And I know most people know this history, but just to remind ourselves, uh, sort of, well, historians, it'd be good to set the context. Uh, this debate's been going on for years in localities and at the state level among scholars, but as Chrissy suggested, it burst into national visibility after the shooting of nine unarmed African-American people in a church in South Carolina in June of 2016. So it feels like this has been forever, as we think about 16 and, and now we're in 18. And after that shooting, pictures circulated widely of the murderer posing with, among other things, the so-called Confederate battle flag and denunciation of that flag followed. Then it was May of, in 17 that the mayor of New Orleans ordered the removal of an obelisk and three Confederate statues, including one of Robert E. Lee, 
You remember the image of a crane removing Lee from the top of a tall pedestal in a prominent position in the city, and you remember Mayor Landrieu's powerful speech that was widely praised by some while the removal was denounced by others. A few months later, in August of 2017, a white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, focused its so-called Unite the Right events around a statue of Robert E. Lee, which leaders of the city had debated removing. While the origins and rationale and consequences of that group stretch far beyond Confederate memorials, of course, their violence, their Nazi regalia, and their hateful speech, covered in great detail by the national media, put the Confederate statues in the national spotlight once again. Heather Heyer, a young protester from Charlottesville, was killed by a man running his car into a peaceful crowd. Now, the response to these events led to widespread and impassioned conversation about the over 700 other Confederate monuments in the United States. Now, dozens of communities have already removed these statues from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, from West Palm Beach to Kansas City, from Maryland to Texas, from Wisconsin and Ohio to Durham and Louisville. The hundreds of statues still remaining, most of them in the South, a lot of them in Virginia especially, are the subject of great debate and discussion. They're entangled in law and politics as well as in historical memory and identity. So the problem's not going away, and so we thought this would be an apt opportunity to discuss the issue among the historians who have a special role to play in thinking about the best way forward. So in our discussion, too, we will also consider the meaning of the shooting of Stefan Clark here in Sacramento and what it might tell us about issues of racial justice that underlie the debates about memorialization. So we'll talk about other forms of memorialization and then generalize from that about uh, what kind of principles might guide us going forward and look at how other bodies that have wrestled with this uh, have put forward their own general guidelines. So I'd like to be, uh, ask my colleagues here to try to understand the situation from the inside out. So what do you think the monuments actually say to those who want to keep them as they are? What, what's the, what's so powerful about these monuments? Well, I can tell you what we've heard. <laughs> um, since we began this process in Richmond, um, we have received well over 1,300 letters that have been uh, put onto our website. We've held a number of public meetings both large and small. Um, and there is essentially three key um, themes that repeat in those meetings. Um, they're all fascinating to me. Um, the first is one of um, the idea of the honorable man. Um, you know, they fought to defend their version of the Constitution. Um, they fought to defend their homes and their neighbors, right? Um, and we also hear things about them individually. Uh, people love to say, well, you know, Lee taught his slaves to read, so it couldn't have been about slavery. Um, I, 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 oh, oh, no, but I'm telling you, they'll say Lee. Um, you know, Lee, oh no, no, you're right. Lee freed his slaves, right? right? And then Jackson teaches them to read in Sunday and Sunday school. And, and so there's this whole piece around this. Um, and then there's, there's the other thing that we hear is that um, there is a, um, this idea of, of um, vindication. And, um, and familial connection. Now, that's the part that gets really messy, right? Um, and I've said this publicly before uh, in listening to some of these folks is that, you know, this idea that, you know, you can really go ahead and love your drunk uncle, but let's not pretend they weren't an alcoholic. And because what's happening here is they are em embodying their ancestor in these figures. So these figures sort of become the overarching familial relationship, the familial sacrifice, the family role. That is how those who are in support of these monuments and leaving them as they are feel. Um, that's what, what we've gleaned um, uh, from the 
the, again, the public comment, both written and in person. And, and they're very powerful. Um, you know, people, people are really, really adamant about these sentiments. And, and I think that that's part of the, uh, an example of the enduring trauma that we, we don't really talk about as historians. I mean, we, we talk about it in the period, but we really don't talk about stages of grief the rate, the way that communities um, come through these things or not, and what they do to rebuild themselves. And that's what we're tackling. That's what, what those of us in the public history side of this are contending with every time someone walks through our door. They're bringing that with them. So um, this, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a real, challenge because obviously the passions on the other side are just as profound, um, just as profound. Um, and these two sides do not hear each other because they are expressing through places of pain. Right? I'll stop there. Is that, is that good? Is that what you want? Yeah. Uh, of course, there's the, the myth that somehow the North was much better than the South. Um, and so from the vantage of New York City and Newark, uh, it's a real challenge to see how uh, many times immigrants in the North um, have really embraced certain kinds of narratives about what the Civil War was about that have also really in some ways denied the deeper complicity and implications of what it meant to be a citizen of New York City or a citizen of Newark. Um, there's a clear pattern in the research we've been doing and the mapping we've been doing. We've been kind of working with Eric Sanderson. Many of you are familiar with his book, Manhattan, which he's kind of mapped uh, now the five boroughs from the vantage of 1609. And if we were to look at the treaties and the transfers of so-called treaties, transfers of land to, from Native American dispossession to the Dutch and the early Puritan settlers, we'd begin to see that these large tracts were transferred under various devices, met much of a trickery and otherwise. And then people like Rutgers, after which Rutgers University is named after, had a large parcel of land on the Lower East Side. He then immediately brought in uh, slaves, enslaved people, to work it. And then he quickly transferred into the landlord business, uh, which is the New York City you know, story of the $24 in some ways, and uh, subdivided that parcel into 600 lots. Right. So in many ways, you can see how the wealth is being built. And to map this, to show it in very clear terms, helps to, I think, displace the mythology of the $24, but also the abstraction that somehow the North was not involved. Right. Um, so I think that myth, which is very much a presently held myth, needs to be constantly challenged, of course. Um, and it does, I think, get back to the issue of trauma and unresolved trauma. And Marion Hirsch, many of you know, who's looked at trauma during the Holocaust, has de developed a concept of post-memory. So in some ways, we're constantly uh, you know, kind of re-traumatizing, but also constantly dealing with this kind of phenomenon of post-memory, which in many ways is the generations after trying to come to terms with unresolved issues, right? So we're talking about multiple generations over long periods of time. And I think in many ways that's a particular uh, challenge for public historians who are not so much just mainly focused on their own uh, monographs, uh, but really trying to engage with publics. And so I think the deeper questions that really require uh, deep cultural, cross-cultural understandings um, and to create spaces in which that can happen um, are, are uh, 
matters that we're grappling with, but oftentimes in the context of, let's say, a commission, a 90-day commission especially, there's absolutely no time for that process to happen, right? So how do we then learn from that and actually create these processes? And it's nothing, it's not new. I think a lot of us have been doing this kind of work for a long time. But how do we learn best practices? And how do we begin to exchange these best practices? And um, in many ways, understand um, the, the similarity across different locations, but also the particular configurations that in which these issues are embedded. So the fact that Italian Americans in Staten Island organized very strongly to protect their identification with Columbus um, is not so different in many ways than other kinds of investments that people have made. Um, so I think we also need to kind of understand those deeper interdynamics that may appear to be totally different from one region to another, but in fact are deeply similar. In terms of um, uh, thinking about uh, how the memorials are viewed um, within the National Park Service. Um, we are thinking of them as sites and places and expressions of memories of the time and place where they were placed there. So not only is it about identity, um, which you alluded to, Christy, it's also about artistic expression. Um, as well as a political moment in which the monuments were placed in and of themselves. So we grapple with the multiple perspectives um, by which the, the monuments express themselves, not only as, um, as the event themselves, but also as the recreation of the event, the imagining of the event. Um, and we grapple with that issue as well because um, y you, um, what is one person's art is, is another person's um, violence. Right. Um, and so uh, as a public facing um, agency that is invested in preserving all of those multiple perspectives, we have to take into account and consideration those multiple meetings and what they mean. And I'd say what we see in Richmond too is that the statues have accrued meanings over the years. And so we find that some people just say, I just love Monument Avenue because it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have, you know, the 10K run there and all these kinds of things. And so that p people are so many layers removed from the, even the intention of the people who built it, not to mention the people that it memorializes, that pulling these things apart is one of the challenges, and I think that's something historians are actually good at. Jack, I think, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I was just going to say, I think one of the things that's, um, where there is some distinction, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Trakaya, is that um, for a lot of the cities and communities that are looking at this question, um, things are not in spaces where they are interpreted as they are in battlefield parks. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are in public squares. This is in front of courthouses. In the case of Monument Avenue, which I, I found this whole conversation actually kind of interesting, um, you know, this is in the centered in a neighborhood, a very, very wealthy neighborhood, and it was built to be that, a real estate development with these, these things. But there, there hasn't yet been a larger conversation about what we do with all the other Confederate uh, statuary that's throughout Richmond that is not in cemetery or on a battlefield, because there's quite a, quite a bit of it. Um, and so th I think that that's, a, a, you know, it, there may be a solution with this concept, uh, with the park, where you know things are within the confines where they can be interpreted by seasoned staff and historians versus what does a city do when it's trying to consider all of the moments um, that make the city the city, right? I mean, that becomes a bit trickier, far trickier. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, to pick up on the trickier part. Uh, <laughs> so I think there is always going to be a tension between the work of historians, uh, which have to be uh, constantly 
uh, bolder and taking up the challenges that are not necessarily defined by the way civic uh, history or civic virtue is defined. And of course, we have to acknowledge the history of, of wealth and power, right, in the constitution of these spaces. Um, so I think uh, in our deliberations in, in New York, but I think it's true in so many places, there's always going to be that tension being played out. And I think ultimately, part of what the North and South and East and West and Midwest all share is really um, the necessity to both um, question what has become the norm of that local regional area, what has become commonly accepted, um, to displace that. And moments such as these um, do that, uh, which is in some ways an opportunity for historians to then uh, do that necessarily necessary groundwork um, in engaging with our publics in various ways. And I, I do think that academics have become a little too comfortable in staying within the university parameters. I think, you know, I think many of us have been doing work in libraries and outside and exhibits and all that. But um, we, in some ways, have to do so much more of that now. I think there's that challenge. I guess I would just say one more thing, which is that I think part of, besides denormatizing, we also have to be decolonizing so that to understand the Civil War and enslavement is, is shared with uh, all the issues that are in New York and everywhere else, and with Native peoples as well, disposition of Native peoples. Yeah. So right here, we could pause and see if people who are with us would like to answer the one question that we've addressed so far, is that what do the people who want to maintain the statues mean by them? Uh, so I'm counting on our collective self-discipline to be able to do that. We will turn after that to what is the, the critique that we have of it. But does this make sense? That if, and there's a microphone that you would stand up to and answer. I would also still say there are still some seats in the front for those of you who are standing in the back. And it looks so good on C-SPAN if all the seats are filled. So you'd be serving, serving a public purpose if you would do that as well. Is there anyone who, who would like to explain, either sort of analytically or from their own perspective, of why they think that the statues um, speak to them as something that needs to be maintained? So there's not. Yes. So you please step up to the microphone. Thank you. Good evening, panel. Um, I'm a former Marine Corps officer, now doing much more difficult work as a high school teacher. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, um, but to me, having you know been assigned to Quantico, to Richmond, visited uh, the museum in Richmond, <clears throat> I see these monuments not on battlefield parks as really about being about a period of American history that that those monuments represent opportunities to teach. I don't see them as a garish figure that looks, you know, they're usually they're generals and I haven't met a dead southern general that harms me. And I, I also think that they're just they're just teaching opportunities when you see these, and many of these men were decent men. Many of them were not so decent. Um, but I, I also know that there comes a point as when do you, when do you stop taking a 21st century value and apply it to a 19th century conflict? Uh, and I use the fact I was, I was looking at my phone and I couldn't remember the number of of Japanese that were killed in the Battle of Iwo Jima, and it's something near 19,000 of casualties. The Marine Corps lost 26,000 Marines and sailors um, in that battle, and we have right in Washington, D.C., a tremendous monument to the sacrifices of those people um, who raised that flag on Suribachi. Are we gonna tear that one down? I mean, those 19,000 Japanese soldiers and sailors who lost their lives were, uh, you know, they were.
parents, they were sons, they were part of Japanese culture, and where does it stop? Where do we have enough sort of intellectual armor to say this was a war that essentially shaped the American um, psyche for a very long time. It was our most costly war, more costlier than Vietnam, the Gulf War that I fought in, uh, more costly than World War I. The American Civil War was our bloodiest battle. And uh, I, as a teacher, don't want to have opportunities and visual, you know, visual reminders that I can teach my student about this really horrible but necessary part of the high school curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other people who would like to speak to an explanation? Yes, sir. I, I think sometimes as a, um, uh, as a historian, I think back of uh, monuments that, uh, that people from long, long ago tore down of the regime that was there before them. And I've often thought how terrible that was because as a historian, it would be wonderful uh, for us to get to know them and get to know what was going on at that time period. And I think um, I can certainly understand. I, for, I, I struggle because I can see those people from thousands of years ago as a historian, a, a disaffected historian, and, and I can be curious about their stories and curious about uh, what happened. Um, it, it takes on a very, very different feeling when I, when I bring in my own self-interest uh, into this conversation, and uh, it becomes uh, a lot more difficult to say, leave these alone as they are. Uh, I think uh, perhaps the difficulty, the, the biggest difficulty that I have um, of just saying, take them down or leave them up is that the underlying issue, uh, the reason why these monuments were put up, the reason why this war was fought, uh, the reason why uh, people feel strongly about it on one, one side or the other is the real issue that we need to tear down. Uh, that's the real thing that needs to be confronted in this country. And if we could do that in this country, I think we'd be able to have an easier time uh, with those monuments, where they are, how they are, uh, e perhaps even without any modification. But the, the underlying issue uh, the underlying reason uh, why those monuments were put up, uh, whether just simply as a, as a war commemoration, which I'm not quite sure, I think that that's why it's the sole reason they were put up. Um, but if we don't deal with the underlying reason for that, there's, it, it's, it, we're, we're just covering this issue with a Band-Aid, but we're not dealing with the wound. Two great comments. Is there, are there any others now? So, I'd ask my, so, so help explain, um, maybe I'll start with you, Christy, since you have done extensive research through 1,300 of these. Uh, what, what, what's the, 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 the sort of typology of the rationale for removing them? What, what do you hear most? <clears throat> okay, um, so there are three to that. <laughs> um, one is they are not just a symbol of a past, but they are a symbol of an ongoing um, uh, mentality and behavior of a nation and of a city um, that has perpetually disenfranchised its people of color. It is a continual reminder of that um, injustice. Um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is um, this other argument, which I'm sure you've heard, and whether you think it's valid or not is really irrelevant. It's what people are feeling. Um, is that we have allowed traitors, 
to dot our landscape, people who fought against the United States of America. And the fact that we allowed these statues to go up is a reflection of white privilege and white supremacy. That's the other argument that we hear. And then I, I have to say, this one is, is less common, but nonetheless um, extraordinarily heartfelt. Um, recently, we um, attended, some members of the commission attended um, a community gathering, and a young man got up and was extremely eloquent and told a story of his ancestor, who was among the first African Americans voted to the legislature in Virginia. And he talked about how proud their family, the story moved through their family. But uh, in the same year that the Virginia legislature was um, assigning revenue to support putting up the statues, they were also putting in laws to roll back things that happened in terms of reconstruct. The exact same day, he, gave, he, he had the material right there with his ancestor, the exact same day. And so for him, it was powerful in another, in another way, and, and people could relate to that. People could relate to the fact that, that so many, the promise of freedom was stripped. The promise of citizenship was stripped. And the more of that stripping that took place, the more the monuments went up. And it is no mistake in Virginia during massive resistance that so many new monuments went up and schools were named after these Confederates in defiance of Brown v. Board. This is not people's imagination. This is their lived experience. So there is a continuation that is attached to those. And, and, and it simply, for them, it simply isn't about military leadership. And you will hear them again, time and time again, tell those two stories um, and, and ask the question, why do we allow traitors? You don't go to Germany and see statues of Hitler. Um, but you will see concentration camps, camps to know what they did. And in the United States, we have plantation houses where people dress up and say, the servants were happy. So there is a very different um, dynamic. And like I said, those emotions are very real and very raw. One of the critiques of the monuments is that um, often they are not rooted in historical fact um, in terms of the placement of the monuments, uh, in terms of the inscriptions uh, which are included in the monuments. Um, and so we have to continually remind ourselves in the National Park Service that we are telling the whole story, that we are contextualizing with historical fact from primary source research um, and the sources, um, not in the way to um, bring a value judgment or a political debate, but to bring the facts to the source. Then we have to contextualize, um, as Christy was saying, why the monuments were placed, where they are placed, um, and the historical moment in which they are placed. So the ro role of the historian there is to do the research in order to ensure that historical fact is brought to bear on the monuments and contextualizing why the monuments are placed there and where. Um, we also have to ensure that um, as the monuments, uh, as the National Park Service has determined that we will not uh, remove or obscure or alter um, monuments within our national parks unless directed by Congress, um, but that we would be committed to preserving the monuments, but telling the entire story from multiple perspectives with multiple meanings. Um, and that's how we bring to bear those, um, those thoughts, those various meanings, the typologies of why removal for some publics are, is the option. 
and why um, for other publics it is not um, an option for them. It seems that I've not heard much criticism of the Park Service's mm -hmm. stewardship of the statues. Have I just not been paying attention? <laughs> no comment. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Jack, do you have a comment about it? Um, yeah, I guess I would maybe um, talk about um, the larger context in which monuments exist within. Um, certainly if we're to think about the civic sphere, the public sphere, and the contestation over that, in which monuments, public art, and markers exist within. So that I would also include downtown areas that are developing a certain kind of history uh, of, of what the city is, and certainly New York does that, but also just you know visiting old Sacramento uh, and going to the railroad museum, I was then struck by the fact that in the 1850s, when the big four were, bef before they were the big four, uh, but they were already merchants in that immediate area, there was a horrendous fire that wiped out the Chinese section. And it turns out that the Railroad Museum is literally on top of that site. Um, so there's a double erasure. Um, of course, what happens soon thereafter is that the Chinese Exclusion Act gets passed. Uh, so, on the one hand, we're, of course, talking about the disappearance of multiple histories and the, and the contemporary dominance of a certain kind of civic story or commercial story or um, uh, city story of the origins of that place. So, you know, it's hard to talk about taking away or putting back. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about simply adding things to the space uh, because unless we really reckon with the di underlying dynamics of, of power and wealth and how they have always impacted on our public spaces and the debate that happens today is also so governed by those kinds of um, influences and power, right? So I think we have to reckon with those questions first and foremost. You brought the definition of monument to be a lot more than men on horseback. You would see buildings or even the absence of things as monuments, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the very design of our urban spaces in many ways are a certain kind of monument to a, a certain development of, right. a, of a kind. Yeah. So, who would like to talk about the critique of the monuments, like saying something that maybe beyond the typology that Christie laid down? For people who'd like to say there's some element of this that we've not discussed that you'd like to put before the group? If you make the slightest gesture toward movement, I will establish eye contact with you and encourage you to. Okay. Um, I think there's a, there's a corollary to what we've all been talking about here. Uh, and. Um, Jack, you touched on this a moment ago, which is to say uh, we can talk about the urgency of dealing with monuments that, of, that offend and outrage, and there are plenty. Uh, but also the corollary is how to, how to address and memorialize and bring back into our consciousness that which has been erased. Uh, and if we're talking, concentrating here just on civil, the Civil War era, there's plenty. Um, not long ago, I was at Fort Pillow in, uh, in um, Tennessee, which as I'm sure most people here know is the scene of the absolute worst massacre of black and some white federal troops as well. And there's a, there's a small state museum on the site which refers to this as a controversial event. Uh, and if there's any place in the country that cries to be a memorial to black troops, it's Fort Pillow, a national monument, not a little bitty out of the way controversial state monument. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens's house in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania was almost erased uh, uh, to be replaced by a convention center and only through a heroic local effort uh, were people able to save a piece of it. And what remains there is woefully underfunded. Uh, the, the, the vestiges, or the, not the vestiges, but the, uh, 
uh, landscape, the geography of the draft riots in New York City, the worst riots in American history, hundreds and hundreds of dead, uh, involved the mass lynching of African Americans and so on and so on. And I, I would love to see as part of this whole larger discussion, right. uh, more, more focus on how to creatively, creatively interpret and memorialize uh, events like this that are troubling in different ways. And I do think to add, to restore to our consciousness pieces of history that are gone from public memory uh, helps to redress the balance, uh, which is now weighted, understandably, down by these hundreds and hundreds of Confederate monuments that we are rightly concerned about. I think Richmond's experience bears out your point. We hear a lot of people uh, talking about the center of the slave trade and uh, restoring pieces that are lost. So it may be that the, the struggle is having a catalytic effect to lead us to bring these more to the surface. So I'd, I'd agree that it's historians' job to make the most of the situation, to get from it what we can. But I find pretty widespread belief that what we need more history rather than less. Right, and, I, and there's also um, a rising, which I'm actually delighted to see, um, uh, um, there is a, a rising interest in the arts community um, to take away some of the power creatively, um, not just by adding new statuary, but how do you even address what's there? Um, and and. So when we say context, it could mean many, many things. Um, and it could be expressed in some, in some pretty provocative ways um, that don't mean defacing, it, that don't mean anything else other than there is another way, what if we put a different lens on this for you to see it? Um, in, in certain circles, I shouldn't say certain circles because that sounds so whatever. But among folks who just have been talking freely about this um, uh, in, in Richmond, an in open space um, talking about this, um, there's, there's, there's this really interesting mix of people that, that um, have been talking about it um, is in, in this idea of what if we made Richmond a monumental city? What if we took all of, because there is a lot of different statuary uh, in the city to a lot of other things. Yes, obviously a Confederate statuary kind of predominates, but it's not the only thing. You know, we do have Shaco and the untold stories of the slave trade there. We do have freedom trails and, you know, really significant sites that, that still exist. And statuary that's been placed on the landscape um, that commemorate um, other events that are of equal note or individuals of considerable note. And what if we took the view of our city um, and, and, and just, you know, told all of this nuance? You know, what if we did that? But again, I think this, the idea of engaging the arts community is critical. This isn't just an academic exercise. Um, they have power because they strike emotionally. Uh, try as we might, we don't always do that as academic or public historians. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the, um, there, there are many great examples of, of um, what we can now call um, creative nonfiction uh, or kind of creative engagement with history. Uh, it was not that, well, a, couple of dec a few decades ago when Repo History in New York City did kind of amazing, fantastic work by putting up temporary signage, um, kind of talking about the disappeared histories at certain locations in which that had happened. Um, and right now, the Monument Lab in Philadelphia has been doing amazing, amazing work with artists um, around the city. Uh, so these are kind of ephemeral um, engagements, but oftentimes documented and then written about, which is helpful. Uh, I think it also speaks to uh, what Dolores Hayden and other people have talked about in terms of the power of place. Um, I think one of the problems with, I think, the work we do in monographs and the way we write histories is that we tend to kind of ignore, we oftentimes ignore, not all of us certainly, um, the specific places in which people live 
and in which these same events were happening. You know, to, to be able to, to literally map that and have people understand where they are in relationship to these events um, is a very powerful kind of uncanny um, slippage between the present and the past and the future, right? So I really think the power of that kind of mapping, which in some ways speaks to having all of Richmond and all of New York City become those historical places and having the opportunity for people to discover what had happened and who had written a poem in, you know, about that place and, and have it literally be kind of uh, haunting us in the present, right? So that's living, yeah. I wonder if it would be helpful perhaps to show the slides that you have about the generalized principles uh, about this. And so maybe Jack and Turkai would like to talk about what this is that we're getting ready to see when the projector warmed up. The drama builds in the meantime. You have the statement. Okay. Do you want to, why don't you start with the statement? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we asked that some pre material go out. Um, the Advisory Council uh, on Historic Preservation, which is the independent federal agency that is responsible for, um, for advising the President and Congress uh, on historic preservation matters. They just came out with uh, their statement, policy statement on commemorative works. Um, I was hoping to provide a copy for you as pre-reading and thought it would be linked to the site, but I don't think we were able to do that. Um, but the Advisory Council um, released some guiding principles um, to advise communities on how to begin thinking about and grappling with the issue of commemorative works, um, which, which are offensive and controversial. Um, how to engage the public um, in uh, determining what would be the right for their communities. Um, because this is not only a national issue, is it a local issue um, and the context for how a monument is placed at the local level um, may determine a, a different course than a national policy. Um, but it reconfirmed a commitment to the ACHP commitment um, policy statement reconfirmed a commitment to stewardship of these commemorative works. Um, with the understanding that values do change, the values by which the, the memorials were placed change through time and over time, and that there has to be historical context developed around why the monuments are placed there as well as that historical fact. Um, they also recognize that not every monument that is placed is historic in nature. So we have to determine as historians um, to get, engage in that process, is this monument significant? Is it deserving of preservation in and of itself as a historic resource? And if it is not, what, what then does that mean? What are the possibilities? Um, they also determine that no action moving forward can occur without consultation with communities, with those affected, with government agencies, with, with descendant communities, individuals, um, so that these decisions aren't made in a vacuum without understanding the very real and deep um, connections that communities and individuals have to these monuments. And um, finally, that there are multiple alternatives um, to how a, a commemorative work or a monument can be treated and that no option fits all um, and that it is the responsibility of each of us, communities, government officials, to determine which is the best treatment alternative for that. Um, and finally, uh, they held the position that these debates, the consultation, is a moment of, for public education. Um, it is a moment to really discuss the history of the United States 
um, and to learn the lessons and resolve to move forward um, in whatever way we want to determine as a nation that we need to move forward. So. Do you think that marks much of a change from what people might have thought five years ago? Very much so. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, there, five years ago, I believe, um, and, and I'm taking off my hat here, uh, the, the belief that, oh, these, these exist, these monuments exist, and there was no thoughtful um, um, conversation or dialogue about why they exist or what should be done. They are, um, the monuments themselves were rooted in this place where people pass by them without really understanding or necessarily questioning their existence um, until the events which you enumerated happened, which forced us as a nation, as individuals, to then think about what it means. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brennan, you were gonna say something? I didn't, do you still wish to? Good. Fergus uh, said, I think it's critical that we as a historical profession realize that people don't learn their history from the books we write. If they did, our children and grandchildren have a lot larger educational fund. <laughs> they actually learn their history. They learn their history from what we tell them is important, that historical house, how, what we name buildings for, and those monuments. And Ed and I were part of a generation that sort of uh, thought that we didn't need heroes in history, so we sort of, you know, Jefferson, <clears throat> we looked at Jefferson and we decided, well, you know, he might have written these words, but in reality, if uh, genetic testing is right, he probably took advantage of a young African-American woman and fathered children and, you know, had enslaved children, and we sort of disavowed all of this. This came home to me when I went to the University of Illinois uh, after doing graduate work at Princeton where I was so anti-Jefferson and one of my dear friends and colleagues had written a book on Jefferson, but he came at it, he was anti-Jefferson because he was a monarchist, that is, my colleague. <laughs> and I realized it's more complicated than that, <laughs> than, than we normally see it. <clears throat> but I, what I want to say is that we may not actually need heroes, but I think what people see in monuments are role models. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And there are so many role models there besides these Confederates. There are all those white Southerners, as well as African Americans, who fought for the Union. But and no, I just there, want there to- There are monuments to them. I've been saying, we need to recognize them. This is, this is the point I'm trying to make. It's not just using augmented reality to explain the story, but we can raise monuments to a Benjamin E. Mays. In my hometown of 96 South Carolina, where Dr. Mays, if you don't know who he is, that's a shame on you as historians, because I think he's the greatest man that came out of South Carolina, even though he's from 96, South Carolina, my hometown. He was a longtime president of Morehouse College and the mentor to uh, Benjamin E. Mays. And, and literally, as many people see as sort of the intellectual or the grandfather of the civil rights movement. And that little community of Greenwood has erected the first statue to a person, and that is to this great theologian, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, a black man who saw the humanity in his oppressors. But I wanna, I wanna go one step further. We need those alternative role models, not necessarily heroes that we sort of, I think we did a good job of saying that you know, it's more complicated than that. And I just want to say to Takaya especially, what you folks have done with Penn Center and Buford and raising a monument to Reconstruction. This is important. C. Van Woodward, during the sesquicentennial, said no one's calling for commemoration of Reconstruction. Well, the National Park Service has done something. And this is important, to look at those unsung heroes. You told the story of the of the individual whose father was a legislature in Virginia. There's so many of those. Yeah. These are extraordinary heroes, black and white, who stood against the grain for, for the principles that Jefferson, with all his faults, wrote about that all men are created equal. And I think we need to do those. And we as historians have to understand that we have to be engaged with public history because that's where people are learning their history. And you're not gonna change a Tillman Hall, you know, 
uh, that's Clemson where I am now. But you can rename it maybe Gant Tillman Hall so that Ben Tillman has to live with Harvey Gant the rest of his life. <laughs> but also say that we can make progress, that we can move forward, we can accept our history and build upon it and do what's right in terms of making a better America. So I want to call all historians to be involved with the park service, with public history. Uh, we think, you know, we live in our world, write in our books. That's good, but only our children and relatives read them. So let's <laughs> get out there and make a difference in terms of public history. And thank you for this panel. Thank you to Kai and Michael Allen and all the people that worked so hard to get Penn Center and Buford the first of the reconstructs, there's so many more that needs to be done. He said, every local community. And why I brought up Ben Mays is, that's my local community. You can find, I have never seen a community where you don't find those alternative role models, no matter where you are. You know, whether it's in the Valley of the Shadow, anywhere, there are those who stood for the right things. I'm a historian, but I don't write monographs. <laughs> I also live in New Orleans, and I daily walk by the empty pedestals, um, the broken columns, the damaged plinths, and I see the open wounds. Um, but I don't see a whole lot of conversation in that wrecked landscape either. And I'm very skeptical of strategies of accretion, um, and I want to introduce, I think, another aspect of context um, that we hope keep in mind particularly in our digital or social media age, where there's a lot of talk back and forth, but not a lot of talk with one another. And as a historian, I'm also a citizen and a resident, and I see my role as talking to other people mm -hmm. and encountering difference and not necessarily trying to convince them of my perspective. And I think two things that came up in this panel that I think we hope, I hope we'll sp spend more time thinking about in terms of context is, first of all, um, the parks are protected places. The very fact that they're um, sort of public spaces, but rarefied public spaces where um, there's a sense of stepping out of normal life may lead us to a sense of where we might have these productive conversations about contested pasts. So I think that's really important. And the other thing that Jack brought up, again, denaturalizing um, these asymmetries that we see in these monumental landscapes is that um, the impermanence and how that jarring experience may lead to, I think, more authentic conversations. So. I'm hoping that we can, rather than think about strategies of accretion, which I think are always asymmetrical, think about this whole notion of stepping out of what seems normal to us, both as professionals or experts, but also as citizens, where we can encounter one another and have these authentic conversations. And I'm not really sure the public spaces, as we're thinking about them, are the places that we're ready to have these conversations right now. Great, thank you. Other comments? Yes. Hi, I am um, new to Memphis. That's where I make my home and I do my work. And I kind of feel like through this conversation, there are a couple of things that we haven't really touched on. And that is the system that allows this racism and these things to be perpetuated, which these monuments are only a symbol of. Um, and I, I have issue with us saying, let's have these discussions and not really dealing with the issue on the ground. I have an issue with invoking Stefan Clark and not really saying that because black bodies are not valued as human beings um, and us glossing and jumping to the Confederate conversation without really dwelling in that space. And I think that's really important as historians. We're in a privileged space to understand and build connections between past and present. And in my position at the National Civil Rights Museum, I get to do that every day. Um, but I think that those of you who are more academic scholars have to really take some time and look at that. Um, I worked with Susan O'Donovan on memorializing the Memphis Massacre of 1866. But that memorialization happened before shootings in Baton Rouge and in other areas and before activists in Memphis closed down I-40. There's a direct tie to people making a statement about the value of their black bodies, of their human dignity, to 1866 and Reconstruction in Memphis. There's a direct value and relationship between that and 1968 Memphis and sanitation workers and the riots that happened and all these things in the aftermath. 
And so I think it's great that we want to say, let's have these conversations, let's have these commissions, let's, let's deal with these. But there are some on the ground realities that those of us who are really working in the field of public history and those academic historians who are partners with us in these challenges are encountering. There's a reason why on my birthday, December 20th of this year, the statues were taken down, right? But then a few days later, we were required, or actually a few weeks later, I needed to go into work that Saturday because we had threats against our building because on a Twitter and Facebook feed, which they didn't make private, which you know wasn't the smartest thing that they did, they actually said, they took down our monuments, let's take down their monument. That's a psychological thing that happens as a public historian working in a place that you value, that there is a, a thought out in the space that that is not just, oh, this is personal, this is familiar. No, this means that I have the right to do violence against another community. So I'm, I'm concerned in the way that this dialogue has gone is that we're denying the acts of violence and that these sort of monuments, these public spaces, the things that happen serve as a motivation for people to do harm and seek to do harm. You know, and I think we have to really dwell with that. I'm at an institution that has to have active shooter training now. A whole lot of us are in, the, are in those institutions, schools and museums. That means something. You know, I have colleagues who do this work and are simply writing articles and have death threats. You know, let's not pretend that people aren't seeking to do harm. What does that mean for us? These are things that people didn't have to consider 20, 30 years ago, but it's more of a reality for all of us. And I think we do a disservice to this dialogue when we skip over these things and, and, and don't really invoke the fact that these premises, these things that we're talking about in this room are fine here, but it serves as motivation for people to do real harm and there are real threats against those of us who are working in this work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. I, I would point out that this was the intention of just this sort of comment all along. So thank you. That Jack, you have things you want to say? Well, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, I, I, I'll make two quick points. One is that uh, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And I think there's a fallacy in the historical profession, the academic historical profession, in which somehow, even if we acknowledge the new revisionist questions that emerge as in the present, that somehow uh, by strictly uh, striving for a certain kind of conventional methodological rigor, that that's a superior history to people who are constantly engaging with it on the ground today, right? So in some ways, I think unless we can grapple with that, uh, that conceit, I would say it's a, a conceit as a profession, then I think public history is always going to be perceived as somehow a lesser form of history or a history that, you know, is kind of like the educators at a museum who kind of deal with the public. But in fact, I think it's really through those engagements, those deep engagements, in which people are with the public in a variety of ways and not always agreeing, but oftentimes uh, in the front lines of real conflict, that that actually begs and forces us to deal with questions in the archives all the, all the more sharply. So, of course, there are eruptions that then ripple across the national conscience and then we try to deal with them, but every day in all localities there are these eruptions going on and, and it's easy to kind of not quite grapple with them. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to... Um, uh, say is that um, uh, I do feel it's important to kind of acknowledge the ongoing impacts of eugenics and eugenics and scientific racism. Again, that's kind of the kind of invisibilized, disappeared kind of master discourse in American history that continues to kind of haunt us today and not just haunt us but continues to reappear and basically smack us around, right? Um, and unless we grapple with that, um, you know, so the irony, of, for example, of not just, of course, the dispossession, enslavement, that longer history, but of, of course, exclusion, Chinese exclusion, Japanese 
American incarceration, but also Italian Americans and Jewish Americans and other so-called Central Americans, Alpine Europeans and Mediterranean Europeans being disappeared from 1924 to 1965-68, right? And then for that not to be understood and known by those very communities, and then to then have them take on the positions of basically saying they're, they're really taking on the side of, uh, in some ways, um, a history that actually denies their own, their own history, right? So that's fairly basic, but how are we grappling with that as a profession in our public history? Um, those, are, those are clearly deeply violent, you know, um, and deeply violating and continue to, to weigh that violence on us today. And uh, so I appreciate your, your bringing that very real question of just violence and what happens to our bodies. I, I mean, I think it happens in so many different ways. Christy, Turkaya, you want to say anything about that? She's right. Of course she is. <laughs> um, yep. You know, that, that and, and therein lies the problem um, or, or the element of this that um, defenders of these monuments often miss. They don't hear that. Um, they don't hear that these are symbols of violence um, against um, our communities and about against fellow Americans. See, the, the, um, and, and so consequently what we see, what's so fascinating to me is what we're seeing um, is that as these public sphere um, uh, monuments are being questioned or taken down, we're seeing not only this rise, this you know, this continuing rise, and it's always been present. But we're seeing an emboldenment um, around these thoughts and the, the sort of implicit threats, you know, um, along the D.C. corridor, for example, Interstate 95. There's a, you know, then these folks are around everywhere, you know, uh, the, the flaggers, right? And they're going onto public property and they're erecting these 30, 40 foot tall. Uh, poles and they're putting up uh, Confederate battle flags along the interstate, right? And they're they're just symbols of our pride and our flag, but they're also symbols of terrorism. I don't care whether it's the Army of Northern Virginia flag or whoever. I don't care, and I can tell you that because as a child traveling Interstate 95 with my family, those flags were warnings to my family about where we could and could not go. And so even if I intellectually understand it um, now and I can distinguish them, there is an inherent um, emotional response to those things along my drive that I now have to explain to my children. And the fact that those statuary are representative of that, they're, that, they're, that they're, they're like this, right? You can't. And she's, you know, yes, violence could be bestowed on you at any point in time. And the mentality, the lies that Americans told themselves, particularly white Americans told themselves about black and brown bodies, are what perpetuate the crimes against black and brown bodies today. And as it seems to me as historians, we need you. Those of us on the public sphere, we are having these conversations with our audiences every day. Every day. The, 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 we don't, I will tell you for our institution, we don't have the luxury of spending five or 10 or 12 years trying to put together a museum and a gallery. We have to do it now, which means we have to be engaged with you constantly to make sure that the scholarship that we're bringing and the questions that they are asking us that you can respond to, to help us have these more nuanced conversations that you want in the field because they are not happening. Not in this day and age of self-curated content. Because I am telling you right now, the discipline, we see it, Brooke, we see it on Twitter all the time. These folks think that because we have digitized these archives that they can go in and find exactly what they want to refute your years of work and that's what we deal with on the front line constantly. And so the, the, 
to, to get folks in this sort of multidisciplinary conversation around the meaning of, 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 of all of this in the American um, lexicon is really a challenge. And, and, and at the same time, I want to come back to, and I'm sorry, Ed, I want to come back to um, the comment that uh, the gentleman made about we need heroes. I'm not sure we need heroes. Role models. Role models. I'm sorry. Okay, role models. We need role models. I, I, I would argue that what we need is a truth. Not a truth. We need, we need the ability to understand that greatness is within us even if we aren't great. And that's, for me, why Jefferson will always be a hero to me. I know that sounds really weird. <laughs> and, the, and I went through a cycle of, this man is nuts. Did you read the notes on the state of, you know, state of Virginia? Did you read, did he say that? And, you know, and he put his hands on that baby. And he, you know, I went through all of that. At the end of the day, he gave a value that other Americans who were denied these things, a principle, if you will, in the, in the things that he wrote, that we as Americans pushed the meaning in, of those words. So for me, for me, he doesn't fall into the same spot as the guys who wrote the Articles of Secession or the guys that wrote the, the, the very distinct notions, notations in um, the Confederate Constitution, whether provisional or final. They're, what they're advocating in their language is not something that brings about our better nature, in my view. Um, and I think that a lot of people do understand and can appreciate nuance like that. Um, we just have to continue the conversation. And we have to understand you know, that, that we have to restructure. I think what I'm seeing, at least what I'm seeing on the ground, is that and I saw it when I worked at Colonial Williamsburg, and you know, I saw it in Detroit at the Charles Wright. It, what we're seeing is people really do, the general public really wants to understand their place. And you know, it isn't presentism that we're experiencing as they're looking back on these. They are making very real and valid connections about what these things mean. They are questioning these things. And they are not questioning because of necessarily what they believed at the time. It is the questioning of what they have continued to symbolize in their lives. I think that's a very valid thing to do. And if it's in unprotected space, um, that just makes our jobs that much harder. So you know, stay in the game. Come out of the archives. Come talk to us. <laughs> And, and, and engage with these folks because, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonder. And I can guarantee you when you do that, it will change the way not only you think about teaching, but the way that you think about writing your work when you engage with the public. And there's proof of that in the Mellon study that we're doing. Um, yeah, you've got to get out there. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, I just, I kind of want to push back against the last comment um, because I hear you saying from the perspective of a public historian, we need you, ivory tower historians. And I, I hear you making this very compelling case that ivory tower historians will benefit from reaching out to the public. And I want to flip that. Uh, I kind of think we need to talk about the moral ethical responsibility of academic historians to reach out to public historians. I don't think you should be in the position of having to sell us hmm. on why we should do this for our own self-interest, for the prestige of the profession, for the way that our writing and our scholarship will benefit. Um, we, we talk about the ethics of conducting oral history so that every party feels benefited. Uh, and I don't think we talk enough about the ethics of doing history at large and the responsibilities that come from the knowledge we accrue and the research we do. So respectfully, I disagree. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments? Yes. Well, you get out 
Um, no rush. I just want to talk about, I'm a California historian, and I want to talk about um, public art in the city of San Jose, which is a really interesting uh, counter to some of what you're talking about. San Jose decayed after World War II as the subdivisions proliferated. Ken Jackson called it the nation's largest suburb. And as the downtown began to be rebuilt and redeveloped in the last 20 years, by that time, San Jose has roughly a third Hispanic, a third Asian American, and a third Anglo. When the mayor, Tom McHenry, tried to erect a statue of his ancestor, who was the Anglo conqueror of San Jose, the uh, Hispanic community wouldn't put up with it. And now the very heart of downtown is Cesar Chavez Plaza. And there's a monument to Ernesto Galarza that leads from Cesar Chavez Plaza to San Jose State University. San Jose State University has erected statue, a statue of Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Mm. And so because there's no Anglo hegemony in this community anymore, and because it's, it's a new downtown, the mobilized power of people in color, I mean, there are plenty of problems. I'm not trying to say it's utopia, there's a lot of economic inequality, but the public art, uh, I should also say that um, the courthouse has a big bas relief by the uh, late Ruth Asawa that commemorates the Japanese American experience. So the public art in the most prominent places in downtown San Jose reflect the character of the community in a very positive way. And I just think it's a, it's a tribute to what mobilized communities of color can do. Great, thank you. And I think that you know, all of these statues embody the structure of power at the time they were put up. And the structure of power is changing. And so these conversations that we will have as people who did not have a voice before have one now. And it's, I think they're inevitable. It's sort of a theme that I, and I selfishly want to use um, this moment to help think through since we have to write this report pretty soon. <laughs> the idea of accretion that Vernon used or accrual or addition, which I think a lot of people see as the easiest way out uh, of this, uh, versus Jack is talking about displacement and disappearance and so forth. And some people think that as long as the Confederate statues exist, that no other additions can possibly counter them. Uh, and yet we hear historians also believing that maybe the statues that uh, exist can be, must stand to be taught with, to teach about the very structures of violence and injustice that they embody. I, that's the thing that I don't really know what to think about um, is do we let people see what previous generations did and explain why? Or do we think they emanate, radiate such a, a kind of message of injustice that they need to be removed? I, I'll, I'll start with my colleagues on the panel. And just in general, is, is addition a model? Or would you pretty much have to remove things in order to begin to uh, have a healthier ecosystem? Well, it's my feeling that if New York City um, in, in, um, in the stories that it tells through its parks and, and uh, the context of the monuments that uh, are in the city parks and the way it thinks about landmarks and the stories that it tells about um, not just the immigration story, which is what New York City likes to say it is about, but also the, the deeper stories of dispossession and enslavement. If, if that's the context, if, that's, if that's, the, uh, that's the civic sphere that we're working with, then I think my answer to this question of taking away or keeping it there changes, right? But without that being there, then how do we then make sure that that context is really there? And of course, that's, that's the scholarship is largely there. Um, and the scholarship is getting better in some ways because um, of the new social history, the new cultural history, the new labor history. But I would also add 
the scholarship is getting better because American history is being internationalized. Uh, so in some ways it's a corollary to the San Jose example in which not only are more people now democratically a part of the decision making and the, and the pushes and pull of what happens in that town square, but the scholarship has gotten much better because we're no longer simply um, talking about, uh, certainly not just in Anglo-American history, which hasn't been true for a long time, but I think the more we get uh, Caribbean uh, scholars, for example. I mean, I'm thinking now of Michel Rove Trio, uh, who wrote that fantastic book on the silencing of the past, um, uh, Power and the Making of History, right? W the more you get more rigorous um, kind of uh, relational histories about America and the Caribbean, that forces uh, American historians, it raises the stakes of how more rigorous our history has to be. Um, it also means that we can no longer be simply thinking of a domestic history, which is kind of the way we've been talking today. Um, just in the context of how Latinos and Asians get racialized, it, uh, the, the foreign, so-called foreign part of it and the wars part of it gets dropped out. And we tend to focus on the domestic civil rights agenda. And certainly that's not where Dr. King was going. He was understanding the far more global dimensions of, of policies and the nature of from the Vietnam War to the wars that we're fighting now, but have largely disappeared in terms of the kind of questions of violence that we're also addressing. We know it, the violence is there. Uh, you know, in the same way that we knew the violence was there during the Vietnam War, but we were being constantly reminded during the Vietnam War, and now various policies have really kept it farther from our consciousness, so we kind of respond more starkly, perhaps, to certain things that are happening here. We should respond to both, but to disconnect the two means that we're also not understanding, for example, the phenomenon of yellow peril or Orientalism. Um, and that that's still such a powerful force in the way contemporary American foreign policy is being waged right now. Ironically, too, even the Confederate statues erase violence at the heart of the war. It's like everybody's sitting around at a horse show, you know, uh, rather than doing that. So we've used our time. Jack, I, I didn't give you a chance to actually comment on the slides. Is there anything you'd like to say that could maybe Well, sort of just to say, I'd, I'd encourage you to go online and look at the, the report of the Mayor's Commission on Public Garden Monuments, and I'll just quickly show you what I'm talking about. Um, there are some values and guidelines that we came up with that are a little different than how the National Park Service did them. And um, I feel that this was the best part of what came out of our deliberations. We talked about these five values that need to be part of the criteria of uh, evaluating current uh, monuments, markers, and public art, but also all future monuments and uh, uh, public art and, and markers. And each one has its own definition. This is a slightly edited and, and uh, a kind of compressed version. But each one you'll see kind of builds on the other. So it really actively tries to grapple with this additive language. You know, somehow if you just add more monuments and you had all the money in the world to add more monuments, then that will somehow address these questions. But of course it doesn't quite deal with it. So the question of power and the question of um, complexity and relationality and intersectional natures of how power operates. These are all things that I think as historians and certainly now with the women's march in which intersectionality is, is kind of a everyday term, but it really comes out of third wave feminism decades ago, right? So how do we begin to really kind of engage with these more complex questions that ultimately also have to deal with justice? So these are the criteria, and I think we're all proud of the, the 15 of us are proud of the criteria we came up with, but how to actually operationalize them especially with a six million dollar uh, capital fund, right? I mean, that's not gonna build enough additional monuments to begin to counter what's already there and to be able to balance them out. So that's a, that's a deeper challenge. And I, I don't think um, augmented reality and virtual reality is the all-purpose solution, but I do believe that we have to democratize and have far more perspectives uh, that are rigorous uh, out there. And for me right now, that's as opposed to spending $6 million on two monuments, 
Um, I think there can be more stories that are you know, facilitated by these other social media platforms. So I don't think it should be either or, but we do have to think about that strategy as well. Thanks very much. Dracai and Christy, anything you want to say? No. To wrap up? Okay, I believe everyone's tired. Thanks, everyone. And uh, I think that we, we embodied actually the theme of the conference tonight, the forms of history. They're talking to each other. I think one thing we've seen is that we all need each other to make each other do as good as we can be. So good evening. I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. <laughs>